welcome mortals to the Countess and Kristoff Variety Channel. If this is your first time joining us today, you've come to a really great video. And if you've ever wanted to make your own wine, this is the video to start with, I promise. Make sure you stick around to the end to catch all the fun happening here in the lab and catch every step. All right, so this is gonna be a three-part video series. So part one, which is today's part, this is going to be your equipment. This is going to be covering all the equipment that you will need to make wine at home. Um, I'm gonna try and keep it relatively inexpensive for you guys so that you guys can afford your equipment. All right, so let's start off right first off with the basics. First thing you will absolutely need for making wine is a fermentation bucket. This is a two gallon fermentation bucket because I typically make one gallon batches of wine. This has a hole drilled in the lid with a very tight fitting lid. It also has an O-ring. The O-ring is so that you can insert your airlock into the lid. Now, thing about buckets is you wanna make sure they're nice and clean. You wanna make sure your groove is mold free and debris free. You wanna make sure your bucket's nice and clean and they haven't developed any off-putting odors. They will develop odors from winemaking because just natural things for fruit and wines do. You can see I've got Sybil behind me on the chair. She's so cute. <laughs> so primary fermentator, very, very helpful. On mine, you can see that I have actually labeled where one gallon, one and a half gallon, and two gallon ride because I typically make one gallon batches. Next thing you're going to need is a fermentating mesh straining bag. So this is basically a large bag that you put your fruit in to help it keep particles out of the wine. Um, primarily use this with fresh fruit in your wine bucket. It just fits right in there and then all your fruits stay in there and then when you strain it and lift it out you don't have as much siphoning to do and there's not as much sediment on the bottom. So after two weeks, you need to take your fruit and wine solution out of here because there's too much airspace. Too much airspace in a wine is gonna cause it to sour. So you wanna put it in a more confined space so that there's less airspace so that it doesn't turn bad. So after your two week firm primary fermentating, you're gonna move it from here into here. Now, most people use glass carboys. I don't. I actually use really inexpensive Hawaiian punch bottles. You probably recognize it. They're really easy to clean, um, really easy to sanitize. They're easy to carry because they have a handy dandy handle. Um, I easily drill half inch hole in the top with my half inch drill bit. And I put the same little rubber O-ring that's in the lid here, right in here, so that I can put my airlock right in there. Um, if these start developing off flavors, I don't feel bad about chucking them in the recycling bin and giving them a new life. All right, let's talk about airlocks next. So airlock is the little device that's going to sit in the top of your primary fermentation bucket in that little rubber o-ring we talked about and it's going to keep dust, fruit flies, insects, and other contaminants out of your wine while it's fermenting but still allow carbon dioxide to escape because as your wine ferments it's going to make gas. The yeast is going to burp and create carbon dioxide within the wine and it's going to want to escape. Um, so you need these so that it doesn't blow up and like pressurize inside the bucket. These have a little line in the, about in the middle of them that's where you're going to fill it with water and then the water prevents anything from going inside but the little cap will raise up inside here as the carbon dioxide fills up and then lets the gas bubble out. Really cool to watch your wine bubbling the first couple weeks and watch the little bubbles escape. I really like that. I typically will uh, take these out and wash them out, rinse out the water, put new water in every time I'm touching a bucket because I get a lot of fruit flies here. Airlock's really, really important. There's a couple different styles of airlock too. There is a style that is like a double bubble boiler. Um, I typically like this one. This is the kind I've been using since the beginning and it's never let me down. Uh, 
these tend to sometimes they do wear out you'll get a little crack in the thin part of the tube um, or sometimes up here the, when the plastic gets brittle then you'll have to replace them I typically get five or six of these for like five six bucks they're pretty cheap next thing I want to talk about is a digital scale so digital scales are really important in weighing your sugar um, for your wine sometimes you can weigh your fruit but I typically don't I weigh the fruit before I process it or at least like a general idea that's about three pounds of fruit per one gallon batch of wine sometimes I use more sometimes I use less depending on the produce Taste your fruit first before you add your sugar so you can kind of get a gauge of whether you need to start with two pounds three pounds four pounds um, your hydrometer reading will also tell you whether you need to add more before you start or less because if you're not in the range where it's suitable for wine, you're going to definitely want to add more sugar so that you get into the winemaking range on the hydrometer. And on mine, it's pretty laid out. It actually tells you where table wine, dessert wine is. If it's not in those two ranges, it won't work. So you need to add more sugar in that case. So how this typically works when you're measuring sugar is I'll put my bowl on top after turning it on and then I'll zero it out. So the bowl weighs zero degrees too and then I just add my sugar to the bowl until it's where I want it to be. And that's pretty much all I use the digital scale for in wine making. All right, next thing that is absolutely, I think, really crucial in wine making is a hydrometer. So this is your tube that you're going to be pouring your wine liquid into. And then this is the tool that's going to measure how much potential alcohol is in the wine that you're making. So typically what you do is you, you make your wine and right before you add your yeast, you will pour some of it in here and then you'll stick this guy. It has a bulbous end full of air and a weight. And then there's a scale here right at the top. And so you're going to actually submerge this into the liquid. I like to give mine a little spin so it doesn't stick to the edges of the tube. And then you're gonna read what the liquid falls to. There'll be like a, an arc or a half circle. And wherever the lowest part of the circle is lands on that tube, that'll give you the specific gravity of your wine or the percent of potential alcohol that resides in the wine that you have. This is also a great tool to make sure that your wine is finished fermenting before you actually bottle. I always store mine in its original case because it's got styrofoam on the top and bottom and the instruction sheet inside. Um, and then I always store that right in here. And then this actually goes into a plastic bag that it came with just to keep dust and debris out. All right. Next thing I want to talk about are cleaning brushes. So these guys are really, really useful. I did have to get these at Amazon. Uh, you can't find the, like the long handled ones like these on in regular grocery stores. At least I've never seen them. Uh, sometimes you can get them at a wine making supply store, but I only have two around in my area and they're pretty hard to get to from here. So it's like a day trip when I go, but I make it fun out of it. I have a couple different thicknesses of brushes. This one is a lot thicker and I use this for cleaning carboys and primary buckets and bigger jugs. This one has a smaller uh, brush neck so it's a lot easier to fit inside of bottles when I'm cleaning and sanitizing those for use. You will need some typical kitchen type equipment too. Uh, a masher is always very, very helpful for breaking down fruits inside of your fermentation bucket, uh, something to stir with, and something to ladle your wines into tubes and stuff is always also very useful too. Um, I typically will not use any of these tools made of wood. Um, plastic or metal is the way to go for these because wood can felt off flavors and contaminate your wine a little bit, so I always avoid wood 
whenever making wine. And I also keep these tools completely separate from any other kitchen equipment I use. These never have made food with. I bought them specifically for winemaking so that I can keep them separate and they stay in the cabinet with all of the winemaking equipment that I have. All right, a couple other things we need to talk about. So the next thing I wanna talk about is racking tubes and siphon. So this little tool is really handy for when it's time to take your wine out of here and put it into here or from here and into the bottles. As you can see at the bottom, it's got like a black end and then there's a little indent right here. The indent right there is actually where the solution actually goes up into the tube. So how this works is, let's see, you have your bucket of wine here and you're going to want to fill this. You want to put this at a lower height, which is why you see my kitchen stool behind me. The kitchen stool I usually bring over and this is where I set my carboy or my wine bottle when I'm filling them so that they're at a lower uh, height. So what you do is you take this, you put this inside of your bucket, you pull up on the plunger and push it down. And when you push it down, the suction actually creates and causes the wine to follow down into the tube and down into the secondary fermenter or from the secondary fermentator into the bottles. Now, there is another handy dandy piece of equipment that I really love using when I am transferring my bottles from the secondary fermentator into the bottle. And I'm going to show you that next. So this little tool here is called an automatic bottle filler. It's got a little button right down here. So when you push it, you can see, you can push it in. So this just attaches to the end of the hosing here, really simply. And then it creates a stopper so that you're not wasting your wine and it'll you can stop it when your bottle is full so typically I'll use this when I'm filling bottles I'll go in and I'll press it right down so that the button is a little harder in the champagne bottle like this one is but um, so you have to have it pressed down in order to start the siphoning section so that actually comes into play where it kind of is handy to have two people when you're moving from the secondary fermentator into the bottles just because there's a lot of hand holding that needs to get done and it's really helpful to have somebody hold bottles for you and stuff. So yeah, typically I'll have, this is a two person job when you're about to bottle your wine, just so you guys know. So yeah, you have to press this button before you start the siphoning action, otherwise it's not going to work. It's going to stop the siphoning action from working. But when your bottle's full, you just lift up on the tube and it stops running out. And then you can safely move to the next bottle, press the button down again, and it starts all over again without you having to plunge the plunger a second time. So it's really, really useful. Oh, another thing. I just found these handy dandy uh, straw brushes and these work great for cleaning small tubing like this. Super, super useful. So I'll link these down below too. All right, next thing we need to talk about is, well, of course, obviously wine bottles. Uh, wine bottles come in a variety of different shapes, colors, sizes, I typically go with 720 milliliter bottles and typically not a champagne bottle um, with the bubble at the bottom because that does make using the automatic wine bottle filler very difficult, as I said. Um, champagne bottles also have this really thick band of glass at the top and that is to secure your wire cage so that if you're making like a sparkling wine, you can wire cage your cork in place so that it doesn't pop out so it can still make the bubbles inside of the wine. Corks. Corks are the next thing that are very, very, very useful. 
um, you will go through a lot of them. So these need to be boiled. I typically boil mine for about a half an hour and then I submerge a plate over top of them to keep them submerged in the water and then I let them cool before I actually go to use them in the corking device. Uh, typically, you have to remember to buy the right size cork for both your bottle and your tool. I typically use three quarter, one and three quarter inch long ones. Um, any wine making store can help you determine what size corks you need and most of the links online will tell you that they will fit 720 milliliter bottles. It's just a matter of inch and a half or inch and a quarter. Inch and a half will go all the way into the neck of your bottle. Inch and a quarter will leave a tiny little bit sticking out. I like to leave a tiny little bit sticking out so that when it is sticking out, I can make a little line on the cork so that I know if the cork is starting to move away from that little line, there's CO2 building up inside the bottle and I can uncork them and get rid of them. This way, I don't have a big mess on my hands. So we talked about corks. Now we need to talk about the corking tool. So this little guy is your corking tool. So after your corks are washed, uh, boiled, and cooled, they're gonna go inside of this device to go into the bottle. This guy's a little hard to use by yourself. So you're, again, you're gonna want a helper to hold the bottle sturdy while you're plunging your corks in. Otherwise, your bottle can slip out and wine can go all over. So you basically set the tool on top of the bottle like this with your cork inside. Place your little handles on there. The plunger, you can see the silver part went down a little bit. It pushed the cork into this barrel. And this barrel actually tapers down slightly more and more and more until it gets into the bottle size. So you basically, once it's in there, you just press as hard as you can. It'll be tough. And then there'll be a magic moment. It'll just give. And then that cork will go right into that bottle and then you just lift up and your bottle is corked. Sometimes uh, you do get bad corks and you have to take them out and redo them. A uh, way to tell the bad cork is if it breaks at the very top up here, you, it'll kind of separate and then I will remove those and redo them. I always boil extra corks when I do it so that I always have enough. I'll do like two, three or four extra just to be sure that I have enough corks to finish my bottling process. Typically when I make a gallon of wine, I'm making five or six bottles of wine total. Um, so yeah, I'll do like 10 corks for a one gallon batch. A couple other optional tools. Well, okay. One of them is not optional. Your journal. Your wine making journal is your lifesaver. I cannot tell you how many times I have referred back to my journal and kept good notes about every batch of wine I have ever made in the last, well, I've been doing this four or five years now, um, and how helpful it's been. I write down my recipe, all the ingredients I use, and then I write down my impressions. Uh, okay, so I did a raspberry syrup experiment wine uh, in 2019. I wrote down my ingredients and then anytime I tasted the wine, I went back and I wrote down what my initial impression was. Uh, so first time I racked it from a primary fermentation bucket to the bottle, I wrote down that it seemed like it lacked fermentation. So I added half teaspoon more of yeast nutrient. It tasted very syrupy, but was very delicious. I think this is too sweet and I don't think that the yeast is working. So by adding that yeast nutrient, you can see in my next notes, checked back a couple days later, wine is bubbling happily, so glad I added the yeast nutrient. If I didn't do that, then I might not know what was happening. I wouldn't know, you know, when I go back a year later or to make this recipe again. So note keeping is very, very, very important. Um, another thing I use my journal for Coincidentally enough, um, I actually put all of my labels in there so I know what they look like and I can kind of not recreate them later. I'm not going to show you too many of my labels because they're really special to me. I work very hard on designing them. Um, books. I have a pretty good library on home winemaking, mead making books. Um, 
couple authors I recommend. Uh, well, this book I was the first book I started with. This is The Joy of Home Winemaking by Terry Gary. Uh, she writes very, very simply. It was very, very easy to follow along. It was actually a comical read too. She shares some fun stories and like it was such a good introduction into a winemaking recipe book that it's still my favorite today. Uh, I have several others that I keep on the shelf. Some of them are very, very complex and sciencey and are hard read. So make sure you read a few pages of the winemaking book that you are thinking about buying and make sure you like it and are gonna read it first because some of them are very complex and very science equated rather than very personable and very easy to read like this one. All right, guys. I think I've talked about all the equipment you could possibly need. There are additional equipment that you can get, but I don't use any of them. Um, I know there's acid meters, some wine makers use those kind of things. Um, but I, this is really all I use. I think, uh, honestly, I have only spent a few hundred dollars on all of my winemaking equipment. Typically the things I spend the most money on are new bottles, new corks all the time, but corks are relatively inexpensive. It's like, I don't know, that bag over there was about $10 for all those corks. I have a really good winemaking supply store, not too, too far, that has corks for me. Um, buckets, I'm always replacing the buckets, so those tend to be another cost that you end up having. Um, but most of the other equipment you can sanitize and reuse over and over again. Sometimes tubing gives out or develops off flavors and you can replace that, but it's literally 10 cents a foot. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's actually not that bad. It's an initial investment for sure, but in the long run, you end up spending far less money making your own wine and then you do buying it in the store because literally the fruit that I use for this I will usually go to farmer's markets or, you know, I'll actually talk to produce managers and grocery stores to see if I can get a deal on something that's about to spoil or, you know, and they are usually really, really great. I will also keep in touch with product man produce managers and grocery stores because they tell me when certain things are coming into season and I'll be able to get them. You can also request that they get certain things for you. Another thing that I find highly useful in home wine making is I will purchase organic juice in a bottle. 100%, as long as it's 100% juice and has no preservatives and no additives, you can typically use that for wine making. Frozen juice goes the same way. In fact, I experiment quite frequently with some of the things I want to make a wine out of. So if you're like me and you really want to try something new, this is definitely an experiment for you. The only thing is you have to be patient. Wine making takes a very long time. It will typically be between six months to one year before you actually get to drink your experiment. That's kind of hard to wait. But you will get to taste it along the way, which is part of the fun. All right, guys. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you learned something really new and valuable and fun. And I hope you continue to join me on the wine making journey. If you have any questions, please feel free to give me a comment down below and I will answer anything that you guys ask if I can. If not, I will research it before I answer you because I'm not full of all the answers. If you like this video, make sure to give it a big thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe so you can follow along to, with all the videos that I have upcoming on all the wine making that I have going on here in the lab. And um, I thank you for joining me today. It's always great to have people join me in the lab. I really enjoy it. I hope I get to keep making videos for you guys forever because I'm having a blast doing it. All right. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you in the lab next time. All right. Time for part two. Link below. Bye.